Hi everybody and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So, for today, we're going to be picking up where we left off last time. You remember last time we covered section 4.1 of Andy Clark's book, Mindware, and we talked about some basic concepts that have to do with the connectionist paradigm. We talked about how neural networks work, you know, these networks composed of units that are artificial neurons that are connected together via weighted connections, which are a bit like synapses in the brain. We learned how we train these networks, a little bit about how we train these networks anyway. We talked about backpropagation of error, training data, uh, so on and so forth. And we talked a little bit about how we can make sense of how these networks perform and what it is they're actually doing by applying certain statistical techniques or systematic interference, you know, a sort of post-training analysis to work out what the network is doing. Because if we look in the network, it's all a bunch of mushy, mysterious vectors. Now, last time I did also add a lot of details that were not found in uh, this chapter, chapter four from Clark. So um, I recommended that you take a lot of notes. I recommend you do that today as well, because I'm still going to be riffing a little bit. Um, today, of course, we're covering the discussion section, and beyond what I've recapped here, uh, th this is all what I've just stated will be it for my uh, initial recap, but I will recap more key ideas and concepts as we proceed through the three discussion points. But do make sure to take notes, because I am kind of uh, talking a lot more off of the top of my head for these these lectures, this one and the previous one. So it would probably be beneficial to you to take notes. Also, before we really get into things today, I want to hear from you. I want to hear how y'all are doing out there. Obviously, we're all in our own unique sort of stressful situation right now, uh, me included. Uh, and whether you're uh, on campus but doing everything remotely, whether you're back home somewhere else in the country, or whether you're taking these courses um, from somewhere else on the planet Earth, we're all feeling the effects of COVID and the stress of university combining together. And uh, that can make it a little bit more difficult to get our work done, uh, to concentrate, to follow along with lectures. So, um, because I haven't really heard from that many of you, I wanted to reach out and just make sure everyone is doing okay with the material. And I wanted to remind you once again, do not be afraid to approach me if you are not clear about something, if you need further instructions, um, if you are not sure about anything at all in the class or if there are some kind of uh, circumstances that have arisen that are making it difficult for you to tackle your workload, do speak to me. I want to be accommodating and flexible. These are strange times that we're living in, and we have to adapt our, um, uh, our university experience accordingly. So, uh, again, I I've heard from a few of you just uh, with a few questions and concerns about assignments. Um, but I haven't heard from too many of you, and I just kind of wanted to keep my finger on the pulse of the class and make sure that everybody's doing okay. How are you finding the readings? How are you finding the workload? Um, how are you finding these lectures? Is there anything else I can do to make your lives easier? Um, anything at all, please do not hesitate to get in touch, okay? So, that said, why don't we dive right into the three points of discussion that we find in Clark chapter 4.2, which is, of course, the discussion section. And we are going to begin with the discussion point that is entitled Connectionism and Mental Causation. As I kind of hinted at last time, uh, some people feel that connectionism poses a challenge toward the folk psychological picture of the mind. Uh, the folk psychological picture that we took a look at in Patterns, Contents, and Causes, Parts 1 and 2. That is because, some people claim, again, folk psychology, that is the attribution of mental states and the idea that mental states can play a causal role in the production of new mental states and of behavior, is committed to a very strong version 
of causal efficacy. So the type of causation that is usually talked about, at least according to some critics like Ramsey, Stitch, and Guerin, the type of causal efficacy that uh, we usually find being talked about in folk psychological discussion is a very strong version, very strong version of causation. Ramsey, Stitch, and Guerin, by the way, in a 1991 publication, say that folk psychology um, involves this strong commitment, uh, or, or rather involves a commitment to this strong version of causal efficacy because of its other commitment, which is what, uh, what they describe as a commitment to propositional modularity. So, what is propositional modularity? Well, in Ramsey's, Stitch's, and Guerin's own words, it's a commitment to functionally discrete, semantically interpretable states that play a causal role in the production of other propositional attitudes and ultimately in the production of behavior. So let's unpack that a little bit. It's very much in line with the classical symbolic picture of the mind that we've been talking about so far, and very much in line with the folk psychological, mentalistic, common sense psychology stuff that we looked at in chapter three of Clark's book. Here we're talking about functionally discrete, semantically interpretable states that play a causal role in behavior and the production of other mental states. So we're talking about neat inner items again, neat, discrete, inner uh, items, uh, items within a syntactic engine that is the mind, um, which are semantically interpretable, so semantically transparent. Even if the system itself is blind to the semantics, we could still make sense of what the system does because it's semantically transparent. That is the view of the mind on the folk psychological view, from the folk psychological camp anyway. But of course we saw uh, during the first part of uh, this lecture connectionism part one, that artificial neural networks don't have a lot of these properties. They do not have functionally discrete, semantically interpretable states. At least they don't in the sense that physical symbol systems have them, or they don't have them in the same sense that physical symbol systems have them. So, um, you know, Ramsey and colleagues are saying that connectionism poses a challenge to folk psychology for these, for these reasons. Folk psychology has a certain understanding of the mind, um, a mentalistic understanding of the mind, I guess we could call it, where we have um, uh, mental states, propositional attitudes that can uh, play a causal role in the production of other mental states and ultimately behaviors. And um, they can be said to be causally efficacious. They really do cause us to do these things according to thinkers like Fodor and Politian and so forth. But artificial neural networks don't have these properties. So, um, and remember, artificial neural networks are modeled on the brain. So if our brains are more like artificial neural networks than physical symbol systems, well, then connectionism would seem to pose a problem for this folk psychological understanding of mind that we have. Um, are folks really committed to this? By folks, I don't just mean, you know, folks. I mean people who subscribe to the common sense psychology or folk psychological view of the mind. Uh, are these folks committed to this? There are some reasons to think that they are. One reason is anecdotal. Uh, for instance, we often employ this kind of folk talk or everyday mentalistic discourse um, during our everyday lives. That's why it's called common sense psychology or folk psychology. We make sense of our own uh, mental states and behaviors and those of others as well by employing this kind of folk talk or mentalistic discourse. So that's a bit of anecdotal evidence, but we know that anecdotal evidence is not really the kind of evidence we want in science or philosophy. We want something a bit stronger. So there's also a substantive line of evidence. The substantive line of evidence concerns uh, the way that the usefulness of folk psychological explanations depend on being able to cite specific mental states in order to explain specific actions. This is to say that specific individual beliefs um, cause or give rise to 
other specific individual beliefs or desires, or indeed any other kind of mental state slash propositional attitude. And all of these gives rise to uh, specific actions. And the key word here is specific, okay? So for example, my going to the fridge um, to get a drink can be explained in part that I believe I am thirsty and that I have a desire to satisfy that thirst and that I believe that there are cold beverages in the fridge, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are specific beliefs and desires, spe specific mental states, that explain my actions there. Those same actions cannot be explained by other beliefs like my cat is hungry or my dog wants to go outside. Those will not explain my going to the fridge to uh, get a drink, right? And all of this fits within the symbolic paradigm quite well, right? We have this inner discretion, uh, in this kind of uh, system where these mental states are neat, discrete inner items. Uh, and we have semantic transparency, right? Um, even if the mind is some kind of semantically blind syntactic engine, um, it still respects the semantics and it still would be, if it were symbolic, in theory, it would be semantically transparent. But once again, artificial neural networks are an entirely different animal. Remember, Neural networks use distributed representations, and they have superpositional coding schemes. So we don't have neat, discrete inner items, at least on a first pass, when we look at neural networks on the level of the, the units and the connections. So um, many of the inner states, because they use distributed representations, and these uh, neural networks use a superpositional coding scheme when they you know, learn knowledge, um, the inner states of the network are all just, you know, different patterns of activations and weighted connections and information is flowing through, which means that the inner states for any number of different representations will overlap. But that's not the same as what happens in the example that I just looked at about going to, to the fridge. There are specific beliefs that you would have to appeal to ex to explain my action of going to the fridge and taking out a drink. Uh, my desire to quench my thirst and my belief that there are uh, refreshing cans of sparkling water in the fridge, for example, are these neat, discrete items. But the items in a neural network overlap because they're superpositional. Um, and this conflicts with this idea of propositional modularity, which is kind of like uh, what I explained on the previous slide, on slide four. So this threat to the idea that individual mental states are uh, causally efficacious, or even that they're neat inner items, this threat against um, the uh, propositional modularity um, of mental states on a symbolic account from the connectionist paradigm is termed total causal holism by Ramsey, Stitch, and Guerin. Um, they think that the way that information is manipulated in artificial neural networks uh, is incompatible with the idea that uh, mental states can be discrete causes, because mental states just aren't like that. It's not like my beliefs and desires are all neat, discrete items. They think the human mind brain is maybe much more like a neural network. So, um, on the connectionist paradigm, we don't have these neat, discrete inner items. Um, this is total causal holism. The causal powers are distributed throughout the activation space of the network, if you like. You can check out an example of this on page 82 of Clark, and it's kind of in line with an example I tried to offer last time. But you could imagine two neural networks uh, trained to do the identical task of answering 16 questions. Um, eventually they will look completely different on the inside, on the inside, right? After training, the patterns of weights and connections and so on and so forth will be completely different between these two networks. So their knowledge will be a sort of um, inner mush, not neat, discrete inner items. Likewise, if we train the second network to answer one additional question. So not only does it have all of the same knowledge as the other network, encoded completely differently, it, it has additional knowledge, and because the coding scheme is superpositional and these representations are distributed, um, the entire space, or large sections of the space, 
uh, probably play a role in um, various representations, various mental states. Similar to how last time I explained that a neural network that represents an image of a cat, um, you know, it might have several representations of images of cats that it can compute. Um, and perhaps they're differentiated by the cat looking in a different orientation every time or uh, being a different color in different pictures. But uh, all of those pictures are going to be represented by much of the same patterns of activation in the network. There are only going to be slight variations within that distributed representation that will represent a black cat versus a white cat versus a tabby versus a, um, a tiger or whatever, right? So how can we respond to some of these worries? Um, well, uh, there are a couple of different ways, um, and I'm not going to get into them in um, extensive detail here, but one way would be to just insist this incompatibility between connectionism and um, physical symbol systems or classical AI is just a surface level incompatibility. Perhaps more study will reveal true inner analogs within artificial neural networks to folk talk. Um, Fodor and Politian might be sympathetic to this, um, but they kind of take a, like, they kind of argue from a different direction where they argue that um, connectionist networks aren't really an alternative to symbol systems at all because they're an implementational level thing rather than a computational or algorithmic level thing. And if that doesn't make sense, just hang on till next week because we're going to get into this stuff next week. But what I mean to say for now is that perhaps the more we understand about neural networks, uh, or rather the more and more we understand, the more we continue to study their properties and their features, um, we might come to understand that there are inner analogs to folk talk within uh, neural networks. It's just that on the surface level, they don't seem to be compatible. Another thing, another approach, uh, or another way to respond is to question the commitment um, of folk discourse to the uh, existence of these neat inner items. And that's very much what Dennett does with the intentional stance, right? Dennett is kind of agnostic about whether there is um, something more like a language of thought or something more like a bunch of connectionist networks. But remember, he thinks that mental states name real abstracta. So there doesn't need to be any neat inner item in the brain for us to still be able to use our folk talk or our mentalistic discourse. We can just apply the intentional stance, as Dennett does, and get away with it just fine. A third way is to accept the incompatibility and reject the folk framework because it is false. And this is what thinkers like the Churchlands argue for. A few thoughts before you choose a response, though. And by the way, this is the, uh, the, the kind of thing that's uh, probably a wicked idea for a critical response. Just putting that out there. But these are the kinds of things you want to look for in my lectures and in my slides and in the textbook when you're trying to set up a critical response. Anyway, before we pick a response, one of the three responses I've just uh, talked about, uh, we should consider some things. Maybe one thing we should consider uh, is that it's not uh, all that impressive, all this talk of weights and connections and activation patterns. Um, uh, Sure, when you just focus on the levels of weights and connections in a neural network, there seems to certainly be an incompatibility with the symbolic approach or with uh, the folk psychological framework. But we've already seen in not very great depth, mind you, but we have pointed out that we can make sense of what these neural networks are doing by applying statistical techniques or systematic interference. We can make sense of those um, uh, messy vectors of all the inner mush by doing these techniques. Maybe, um, you know, maybe uh, these explanations, these statistical explanations that are much more compatible with uh, like a folk understanding uh, is still true and useful, and it's just pitched at a higher level of analysis uh, than the anal level of analysis that, you know, we would be situated at if we were to just look at the uh, inner mush of weighted connections uh, between all of the units. That's one possibility. 
This may also mean that uh, the challenge from uh, Ramsey, Stitch, and Garon, uh, uh, the challenge from total causal holism, isn't such a big worry after all. Maybe we can still uh, make sense of the inner mush. Besides, not every single node in a network, not every single unit in a network takes, um, uh, or rather participates, uh, equally in every input-output transaction. So, yes, rep representations are distributed. Yes, coding of knowledge or encoding of knowledge in a neural network is superpositional, but it's not like the uh, entire network is always involved in every computation every time. Uh, so total causal holism might not be as holistic as it sounds. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more detail here, but I do think you should check out the interesting exchange um, summarized by Clark on page 83 and 84 between all of the thinkers that we've talked about here. Um, it's a very interesting exchange and gives you an idea about how this uh, how this debate has played out within the literature, within the philosophy literature and cognitive science literature. So I'll just leave that to you. And by the way, this would also be great material for a critical response. So that's all I have to say about connectionism and mental causation. Uh, geez, that wasn't really that long. The other um, sections of this lecture, by the way, are similarly not that long. Uh, I guess I should explain the reason why that is, is because I'm, I'm still playing catch up, still recovering, a, still feeling a little under the weather. I think it's a little COVID stress, uh, if I'm being perfectly frank, uh, maybe combined with some, with a mild cold or some late season allergies or something. Anyway, um, so what I'm going to do is try to, uh, deliver the other two sections, which are short, um, as succinctly as I can and leave some room at the end of the lecture to discuss your uh, uh, upcoming critical responses. Um, so anyway, with that said, sorry, that was a weird place to say that. I guess I should have said that at the beginning of the lecture. But anyway, now that I have said it, why don't we move on to the second point of discussion, which concerns systematicity. So concerning systematicity, Clark outlines this very famous argument against connectionism as a good model of the mind. It goes something like this. Thought is systematic. Therefore, internal representations are structured. Connectionist models lack structured internal representations. Therefore, connectionist, uh, connectionist models excuse me, are not good models of human thought. This argument, as you may have guessed, is due to Jerry Fodor and Zenon Politian. Um, uh, they, of course, have this uh, very classic view of the mind, this language of thought sort of view of the mind, where the mind is a formal system, uh, very much like a symbolic computer. Neural networks, of course, don't have these properties, as I've repeatedly said. So uh, their argument is the so-called systematicity argument against connectionism, against connectionism as a model of the mind, I should say. Connectionist networks are not systematic like um, physical symbol systems are. Physical symbol systems are systematic by virtue of the structured internal representations that they possess. Uh, let's go a little further and try to break this down some more. Of course, this whole argument turns upon the claim that thought is systematic. But what does that mean? Uh, well, I've already said that uh, thought is systematic in some sense, but what it really means is that um, any systematic, well, system uh, is made of separate and combinable or recombinable parts. And um, the way that we combine and recombine parts is rule-based, very much in line with the classical symbolic approach toward the mental, right? And there's lots of examples of this, uh, some of which that have informed what we've talked about so far. Like, uh, for example, language is systematic. Clark uh, mentions this at this point in the chapter. Language is systematic in the way that someone who understands this sentence, Josh loves his dog, will also understand the sentence, Josh's dog loves him. Because the, those two sentences are made of many of the same parts, 
Um, and uh, it really just comes down to uh, rearranging the parts and modifying them slightly according to rules to change uh, what those sentences mean. Likewise, when it comes to uttering sentences, the way we put language together in our heads is arguably systematic. This is why Noam Chomsky, with his study of uh, transformational grammar and uh, universal grammar and deep structure, uh, is counted as one of the founding fathers of the cognitive sciences. He kind of did for language what Turing did for computation, and indeed was very much inspired by Turing, I believe. Um, speaking of Turing, uh, you know, physical symbol systems like computer programs are systematic. Um, ones and zeros, symbols on a Turing tape, um, all of this is systematic. Uh, and of course, going back further in the prehistory of cognitive science, the formal logical systems that influenced, um, you know, like uh, Anglo-American logical positivist philosophers who went, went on to influence early cognitive science, well, those formal logics are also systematic. So there's lots of examples from what we've already covered of systematic kinds of things. Even a simple everyday example, imagine cooking, right? Imagine a chef. She's in a kitchen, she's got all these tools and all these ingredients, and she can combine them and recombine them in many, many different ways, following rules to create all kinds of interesting dishes. Perhaps maybe some not so interesting and weird dishes as well, but yummy dishes primarily. So even um, you know a trained chef with uh, a, a proper kitchen and uh, refrigerator and um, all of the ingredients at her disposal, uh, even what a chef does is systematic in that way. And of course, the argument here from Fodor and Politian is that thought is systematic too. And again, I, I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but the reason why is that minds, as we saw earlier, has this, uh, minds have this property of compositionality. Remember, we saw this in an earlier lecture. There's an inner economy uh, comprised of discrete mental states which are causally efficacious. Um, these can be combined, recombined, manipulated, broken down, and all of that is rule-governed. So the compositionality of formal systems, and if the mind is a formal system, it has compositionality, is what makes thought systematic in this way. So what are some replies that we can offer to Fodor or Politian or other thinkers who think that neural networks are in fact not a very good model of minds, even though they're inspired by the thing our minds run on, the brain? Well, um, one reply is to say that classical or physical symbol systems are not the only way to support cognition that is systematically structured. In other words, um, Physical symbol systems, or the classical paradigm, may not be the only game in town when it comes to cognition that is systematic. I'm not going to go into the examples in great detail here because I really don't have enough expertise to do them justice. But Smolensky, for example, it is pointed out in Clark, has created neural networks using tensor product encodings. So here, basically, from what I understand, the long and short of it is that um, representations, which are vectors because it's a neural network, are built and manipulated out of other vectors in a process known as vector manipulation. Um, and this is not the same as uh, a physical symbol system, but Smolensky and Clark would still say it is systematic in a way that would support cognition. Chalmers, David Chalmers, has also explored something interesting called recursive auto-associative memory in neural networks. Again, I'm not going to get into the details here, but Chalmers and others claim that such networks are compositional and systematic. Um, so the point here is just that um, physical symbol systems are not the only game in town when it comes to systematicity. And really, Clark's point here is this. The question of whether there are uniquely connectionist accounts of systematicity, systematicity that could support cognition, is not really a philosophical question. It's not a conceptual or a theoretical question. That is, it's not obvious, or it shouldn't be obvious, 
that depending from what theoretical standpoint we take, artificial neural networks do or don't have compositionality or systematicity. No, this isn't that kind of question. Rather, Clark says this is an empirical question. We need to see if we can actually build neural networks that are systematic in this way. And if we could do that, that would be like an existence proof for systematicity in a neural network. So it's not a theoretical or conceptual or philosophical question. It is an empirical question, and we have yet to answer it yet. Another reply is that human thought has its uh, apparent systematicity, not because thought itself is systematic, but because we've inherited this systematicity from the grammatical structure of natural language. So on this reply, what's happening is we're downplaying the importance of cognitive systematicity, and we're saying that whatever systematicity our cognition seems to display is actually inherited from the systematicity of language, of our natural language. That is, the mind here may be more like a general purpose bag of tricks, like the evolutionary psychologists think. Or maybe it's um, uh, some kind of central domain general processor, like Fodor or Politian would argue. Now, this system will have some systematicity, but not the extreme systematicity that we see in classic physical symbol systems or in formal logics or in systems like that. Um, so we have some lower level systematicity, but not general systematicity throughout the entire cognitive system, throughout the entire mental economy. How do we scale up and get that systemat systematicity that we seem to display at that high level of abstraction or analysis? Maybe it's our linguistic abilities. I mean, we think with language, at least a lot of us do, or a lot of us claim to do. Many of us have inner dialogues, um, and uh, uh, certainly some thinkers have argued that uh, we cannot think without language. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but there is something that strikes me as very plausible about the idea of our, uh, the, our mind's apparent systematicity having been something that we inherited from the structure of natural language. Uh, and natural language might just be one of those domains that happens to be very systematic, and that's where we've inherited from, because we'll have lower level systematicity in some of these modular systems in our bag of tricks. It's just that language is... Uh, language was what we needed to make the systematicity global throughout the mind, perhaps. That's, that's the argument, anyway. All right, so that's all I want to say about systematicity. Let's move on to talk about biological reality and biological plausibility. This is, of course, the last point of discussion in this chapter. All right, so as to the final point of discussion, biological reality, Clark uh, mentions at this point in his discussion that some of the most telling criticisms of the first generation of neural networks, first generation of connectionist research, uh, were those that concerned biological plausibility. How close, in terms of the neurological details, were these early neural networks to actual brains? Um, not that close, it turns out, but we're not going to get into that too much. Rather, we're going to focus on three criticisms that pertain to biological plausibility that are still salient. Um, one, one of these criticisms concerns input-output tasks, uh, in, or rather um, artificial tasks and the way that the inputs and outputs for those tasks are represented. Another concerns um, the use of very small computational resources for discrete, well-defined problems, you know, toy problems, really. And the final uh, concerns the difference between, or rather the distance from, the real details of neurobiological and neurophysiological research. So the artificial tasks and the input-output representations. Um, well, it's often said here, oh hello, hi, this is my earlier mentioned dog. What are you doing? Oh, ah. Ah. Oh, 
We use stinky breath. So the short version of this criticism is that uh, much of the intelligence in these early connectionist uh, attempts at achieving AI was supplied by the researchers and the builders of the network. Uh, for example, many of these first generation networks were limited in terms of their domains, to, limited to what we could call horizontal micro worlds, small slices of, uh, or small versions of the uh, generalized capacities that humans have. For example, um, Rommel Hart and McClelland in the 1980s designed a very famous uh, network, rather it was really three networks strung together, but they created this network that would um, conjugate uh, verbs in the past tense, regular and irregular verbs, and it demonstrated some interesting learning trajectories and so on and so forth. But this is just a small little thing that people, yes, people learn to do this, but people do so much more than just learn to conjugate verbs in the past tense. The same thing with McClellan's and Plunkett's and Cena's balance beam artificial neural networks. These neural networks were trained to solve a physical reasoning problem called the balance beam problem, which again, I'm not going to get into too much detail. And they learned to do it, but this is just a small slice, a part of a micro world where we live in this uh, incredibly dynamic macro world. So maybe one possibility to, to get us closer to true biological reality here is to use more biologically inputs and out, uh, biologically plausible inputs and outputs. The inputs and outputs for the aforementioned networks were simply nodes that were either on or off. Um, perhaps instead of just using simple nodes, um, we could use uh, cameras, robotic arms, you know, stuff that would get our network connected up to the environment in a more biologically realistic way. Um, so we shouldn't abstract away from real world details like we did with first generation connectionist research. I mean, you can say the same about symbolic research for that matter. We've abstracted away a lot of details in both paradigms concerning the interface between the mind and the world. Um, and, you know, when we do this, when we include the environment, we can actually make the computations a lot simpler. So this could actually improve the performance of our neural networks. Rodney Brooks takes this approach with his subsumption architecture and uh, behavior-based robotics. These are not neural networks, by the way. These are modular uh, systems, but um, they're made of simple, uh, almost like feedback loops that all kind of work in concert and all do what they do depending on what is happening in the environment in real time. And these uh, creatures, as he calls them, these robots, basically the forerunners of the Roomba vacuum. Uh, Rodney Brooks is the guy who uh, brought you the Roomba vacuum, as well as behavior-based robotics. Uh, we could make the computations more powerful uh, make our agents more powerful, able to cope with the dynamic environment while being computationally more simple. Perhaps we could bring a similar approach to connectionist research as Brooks has done for robotics research. What do you think? Mm, yes. Another problem is that we use uh, small computational resources for relatively discrete, well-defined problems. Toy examples, as I told them earlier. Um, Early neural networks were trained on artificial examples of real-world problems. So the inputs and outputs um, that real cognitive systems like humans or dogs demand and produce um, are downsized when it comes to neural networks research. Um, you know, we're, and we're usually focused, uh, and this is related to the previous point, on a single problem, not general purpose AI or a general, like domain general cognition, like we seem to display. But maybe we can scale up by using networks made out of other networks. In fact, the um, uh, network I just mentioned on the last slide, Rummelhart and McClellan's network, which would learn to conjugate past tense uh, verbs, was actually three neural networks put together. It would take um, uh, phonetic information, encoded into something called a Wickle feature, conjugated into the past tense, and then output phonetic information for the past tense 
uh, form of the present tense verb that served as its input. It's often talked about as one neural network, but it was actually three networks, and it was able to um, illustrate a kind of learning trajectory that was similar to the way children learn to conjugate regular and irregular verbs. Some critics have said that this was actually built into the network in, in as much as the network's um, training data was kind of set up so that the network would just show this learning trajectory. But in principle, perhaps we could scale up by using networks made out of smaller networks. And this is a nice segue into our next point. The next point concerns distance between um, uh, what's going on con in connectionist research and what's going on in neurobiological and neurophysiological research. Real neural networks, the kind we have in the brain, have features that are missing from many artificial neural networks. There are non-local effects, continuous time processing, uh, different kinds of activation functions, which really, that would boil down to different kinds of neurons implementing different kinds of activation functions in real brains. Uh, heavily recurrent connectivity, we have recurrent loops in our brain, uh, loops between the brain stem and the thalamus, as well as the cortex and the thalamus, may be responsible for producing our subjective conscious experience. So that's pretty important uh, if we want to look into understanding how consciousness works, if consciousness is a computational phenomenon. Um, of course, we saw in our last lecture that models that do incorporate uh, these more biologically plausible features like recurrent loops and, and time-sensitive processing exhibit interesting properties that are not found in first-generation artificial neural networks. So maybe by paying more attention to the neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology will help us make better neural networks. At least that's an idea that we should pay close attention to. Um, McClellan does this when he asks, why do we have a hippocampus, right? We have a hippocampus in our brains. It's this kind of uh, seahorse looking structure. In fact, um, that's what hippocampus means in Greek, seahorse. So we have the seahorse like structure in the brain uh, that does something. What does it do? What's it for? Well, McClellan thinks that uh, following from his research on neural networks, that maybe there are structures in the hippocampus that help train other structures in the neocortex. So we've got neural networks in the hippocampus training neural networks in other areas of the brain. So by paying attention to the neurophysiological details, we could make progress. We should really try and have neuroscientific research and connectionist research co-evolving together and informing each other. This could help us to make progress not only in connectionist research, but in neuroscientific research as well. So what can we conclude here with our little final point of discussion on biological plausibility? Well, um, first generation connectionism did provide us with a radical way, a radically new way of looking at cognition and computation. It showed us that we can solve problems without uh, exclusive recourse to the classic or symbolic paradigm. Um, in other words, physical symbol systems were not the only game in town. But in order to continue this revolution, as Clark says, we need to continue to expand and fine tune the connectionist paradigm. We need to include, we need to continue to include more dynamical features in connectionist research. We need to pay close attention to biological details of real brains. And we cannot ignore non-biological or, non, or, or external factors as well, environmental factors or, uh, you know, different kinds of apparatus that we use to uh, use as a kind of sc cognitive scaffolding. We need, uh, we need to pay close attention to things like tools, artifacts, external symbol structures, bodily movements, culture, um, all of this mental stuff that is kind of spread out from the brain into the world. And Clark is very interested in this kind of thing. So this will uh, become more and more of a theme as we proceed through this class. In any case, if we continue to do this, the result will be an even more radical view of mind and cognition. Not without its own challenges and concerns, though. 
which is what we will begin examining in the weeks ahead. I... Well, today we've reviewed some of the interesting features of artificial neural networks, and we've looked at three kinds of uh, concerns or areas of concerns when it comes to artificial neural networks and connectionist research. We've talked about uh, the challenges artificial neural networks and connectionist research poses for folk psychological accounts of mental causation. We've talked about systematicity, the worry that connectionist uh, models don't have systematicity, um, although that is still an open question, according to Clark. And lastly, we talked about biological plausibility. Next time, we're going to begin Chapter 5, Perception, Action, and the Brain, and we will cover all of the um, uh, sketches section. Yes, sketches, that's the word I'm looking for. We'll cover the sketches section. I mentioned earlier that I had some details uh, to share about your critical response. Your next critical response, I mean. Critical response number two, I've decided to move that due date forward, just like I did with the first one. So, on your syllabus, it says that it's due on the 16th at 11.59 p.m. It is now due on the 19th at 11.59 p.m. So, that's uh, a Monday right before midnight. Um, this is because uh, I've been a little bit behind. I've been trying to play catch up. I've been a bit under the weather. So I'm not going to make you have less time just because I've fallen behind. I'm going to give you a little bit more time to uh, do these second critical responses. And of course, I will have feedback for you uh, from your first critical response before you have to hand in your second one. So you'll have some feedback and you'll have uh, maybe a bit better of an idea of what you want to do for your second response. So um, this is all just to try to make things a little easier for everybody. So um, if you want, you can hand in your second critical response now. Uh, the submission portal is open, but I don't recommend you do that. I recommend you take your time on it. Hand it in a little bit before the 19th if you want to hand it in a bit early. Uh, anyway, that's it. Uh, remember, do reach out to me if you need to ask me any questions, if there's anything going on, if you're not sure about anything, any concerns or questions at all. Please don't be shy about reaching out and let me know if there is anything I can do to make your lives in this class a little bit easier. Otherwise, uh, that is all. Hey, Tula. We're finished. We're finished. So, um, I guess I will see you all next time. For those of you watching this from Canada, uh, from within Canada, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving long weekend if you're celebrating. I probably uh, will be working on stuff for this class, but uh, I'll try to make a little bit of time for a little bit of turkey, you know. But if you're not in Canada, uh, if you're somewhere else around the world, um, I hope you have a great weekend, and I hope you still take care of yourself. As I said earlier, we're still in these strange times, and it seems that we're in the midst of a second COVID-19 wave. So do take care of each other, and take care of yourselves, and I will see you next week for our lecture on perception, action, blah, blah, blah. So wherever you are in the world, though, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, be safe, and I will see you next week for the first part of our lecture on perception, action, and the brain. Bye for now, everybody.